Good evening, and welcome to The Way Out Show. I'm your host, Dane McCarthy, broadcasting to you from FEMA Region 5, deep in the bowels of the United Police State of America. Today is July 8th, 2016, and I have a very special guest with me today, Bob Whaley, retired historian, professor, and uh, we're going to be mostly talking about England and the Brexit and the European Union and where, what might be happening with the European Union and world events in general. But I did want to very briefly touch on the events of last night in Dallas. <clears throat> and I haven't had time to really study this, but you can be assured that I will be one of thousands upon <laughs> thousands of people, citizen journalists around the world, who will be studying and examining and analyzing every piece of news footage and every witness report that comes out of that event. Because we must question the veracity of the reports that we are getting from the United States media. Because remember, the media the law is controlled by a very small number of people and they have an agenda, they have a purpose, they have a direction, they have a narrative that they are projecting through the 21st century. We, uh, it's essentially kicked into gear at 9-11, at and we've seen the developments since. And the, the true police state cannot become fully operational until the American people are disarmed, and this is the way with any totalitarian state, you cannot have an armed population. And so we will continue to see events such as happened yesterday until finally the Congress goes along with the, fear, with the very fearful population who are demanding that our guns be taken away. And therefore, we will have no protection against the depredations of the state, of the criminal state, which most Americans now are aware has taken over uh, the reins of government. So, Bob, it is now time for, for you and I to uh, discuss the events of the day. Are you, would you like to say anything about the way things are going down right now at the moment? Well, uh, I'm a historian, and as a historian, I demand printed history, uh, sources. Do you subscribe to the New York Times? Do you read the New York Times every day? I do. Every day? Every day. Online. 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 Okay, good. Do you read any other newspapers? Yes, I do. Because uh, uh, how about I have... The, how about the Dallas Morning News? How about the Dallas paper? I normally, I normally don't read the Dallas paper. Well, they're the experts on what happened in Dallas, aren't they? Well, <laughs> the, internet, the Internet will give so much more than just what Dallas says. All right, what is the internet? Explain that to me. Well, the internet collects information from all over the world. And yeah, it has, but it's highly selective. Not really. It's, oh, very It's highly. the opposite of selective. What is it? It's inclusive. Okay. Anything, anybody can put anything on the internet. Yeah, fine. I don't read Twitter. I don't read uh, <laughs> Facebook. I read, first of all, historical journals. Well, I don't go on, I don't do tri Twitter or Facebook either. But we both look at the New York Times. How about The Nation? Do you read The Nation? I read any article that interests me. And if it's you, in The nation, nation, I'll read The Nation. But you pick and choose. I read what interests me, yeah. But you, yeah. Well, I, I, have, uh, I have a discipline. The historical discipline is disciplined by two scientific facts. You can't violate the rules of time. Every historian said, when I got my PhD, my professor said, what is the beginning date of your thesis? And I said, 1936. That was the year that the Spanish Civil War broke out. And he said, where are you going to end it? And I said, 1939. So I was going to do a very narrow research degree on three years. I wasn't going to be talking about what happened in 1914. This other people had written about the First World War. That's already in books. Okay, but let's talk about what's going on with Brex Brexit. That's okay. why, really why we're here, right? Okay, Brexit is all 
in limbo. We have the United Kingdom. We have the British Conservative Party. We have a few people like the uh, United Kingdom's uh, Independence Party, which is in limbo right now. Yeah, UKIP. Yeah, <clears throat> and the Labour Party is also in limbo. But they have. So the only thing that counts is who's going to replace David Cameron as the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Well, there's a lot of things that count. But yeah, that's one thing that's in, in that's limbo. Very important. <laughs> okay. But good. they've, but they've, they've uh, <laughs> almost. They seem to have almost selected. Um, uh, Leedsum. Who? Andrea Leedsum. Andrea? Uh, I've heard of a Mary... A Mary... Uh, a some, a no, Mary. Andrea, Andrea Leedsum is... I haven't heard of her. He, she is the, the... She was... There were four candidates okay. for the prime minister. But Boris and Johnson two, is out. Two, yeah. Boris Johnson Well, he is was out. long gone. Yeah. Okay. But there's four others that were wanting, Mary to, wanting to do it. May... There was... Uh, her last name was May... Yeah, that's May. That's the uh, one I'm thinking. Maine, and there was also two men. Yeah. Uh, and then they they both dropped out, and now it was then it was between the two women. Yeah. May and Leedsum, and now it looks like it's going to be Leedsum. Okay. Reece, well, you're Andrea ahead of me Leedsum. on the news. You're ahead of me on the internet. You you have speed on your side. Well, I'm, Le I'm three days behind. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what's not one of the nice things about the internet. But Andrea Leedsum is. Uh, probably going to be this the the pick because she was for leave she was for brexit not yeah. against it right she liked the idea of leaving the european union All right uh so uh but that's going to she's be a, con a conservative she's yeah, a but that's going to be determined at the conservative party conference which is in september and cameron resigns in october right so there's a lot of room there for reconsideration on the part of the government of the United Kingdom. Yes, they they will they uh, <clears throat> you know nothing is said in concrete at this time. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so that's all speculation it's about some, the future. Somewhat speculation. But, somewhat sorry. Okay, but I but that's my interest. Is, okay, is well, the so will you pr you predict that Leeds is going to win? Leeds them. Leeds them. All right. Now, where does what part of the United Kingdom does he come from? Is he Scotch it, or English? She, uh, I'm not sure. It's a woman, it's Andrea. A woman. Andrea. Andrea leads them. Does she live in London? I don't know. Don't know. Don't well, know. we got to find that out. Well, it's a small <laughs> country, so yeah. uh, if she becomes prime minister, she will live in London. That's for sure. Yeah, we know that. Uh, but the question is, Anthony Eden. You've heard of Anthony Eden. You've heard of Winston Churchill. Yes. Okay. When Winston Churchill resigned in 1951. His foreign secretary was a famous foreign minister by the name of Anthony Eden. And Anthony Eden became important for the uh, British Empire from 1935 when he was appointed the Tory delegate to the League of Nations and was a defender of Hala Selassie and the end of the Ethiopian uh, kingdom, which was conquered by Mussolini. So Anthony Eden was a kind of a liberal, left-wing leaner in the Tory party. And then when Churchill became prime minister in 1940, he made Anthony Eden his foreign secretary. So he was the second in command of the liberal branch or the left-wing branch of the divided Tory conservative party. And Neville Chamberlain represented the old past, the reactionaries who were appeasing Adolf Hitler. So that background is necessary in order to understand British politics, I think. Do you have any questions about that? Well, uh, I think that British politics have, are way further to the left than American politics. I agree with that. Uh, and uh, at least they have been for quite a long time. And uh, <clears throat> well, it's it, it's getting more integrated through the banks. But I, I the, do, the 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 Bank of England and the Federal Reserve Bank are getting closer and closer. The pound and the dollar are playing politics behind the scenes. Well, the pound is has dropped in value yeah, considerably. Has, that's right. In the last two that's weeks. That's because of the exit vote. The Brexit. You keep calling it exit, but it's they're they're calling it the Brexit. That's a lot British, of jargon. British exit. That is jargon. Well, of course. The United Kingdom had a vote. The voter had a vote 
Do you want to stay in the European Union yeah. or do you want to leave? Yeah. That was the choice on the ballot. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> British exit. Yeah, but British exit is just propaganda. It's like well, NATO. Nobody translates NATO. NATO is the North Atlantic I know, Treaty yeah. Organization. I know, I know, I know. Well, that's another thing we should talk you, about. We you, should talk about that because this is something that's going on right now. Jogging, yes. Okay, well, fine. Uh, <laughs> Obama is in Poland, in Warsaw, right now. Well, where is he in Warsaw? He's in Warsaw. Well, how does he know anything about Dallas if he's in Warsaw? What does he By know about that? By the internet, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Who writes his speeches? <laughs> I, but, yeah, it was all over the news. It got, got inter, international news, yeah, well, Dallas. Uh, we'll say Obama uh, so, is a great speaker on television. So he's not... Yeah, he's but but uh, those speeches are carefully drafted by somebody yeah, in the White House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he he's got the oral delivery. He's a good front man. Good front man. Now yeah, we got it. Knows <laughs> how to read from a teleprompter prompter very well. Very good. He's a great speaker. Uh, and so the interesting thing, though, to me, yeah, is that NATO. There, we have a resurgence of the old Cold War fears uh, between the, the Western Bloc and the Eastern Bloc. There is uh, some there is and, some consideration of that, but that's not the and, main problem. Well, Russia is not the problem any longer. Okay, what's the problem? From the point of view of the United States, the Middle East. What are you doing about Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Israel? Yes, there. That's a huge. That's and the ongoing real issue. thing. But this is new. What's this new? This is very new. This this. Increased tension between that's an the artificial. Na the, that's artificial. The NATO countries okay. and Russia. You right. don't you don't buy it. No, I think that the United States State Department is playing hanky panky. Yeah. With the Ukraine, which is none of yeah. their business. You're right. And Russia. You're exactly right on that. The Russian yeah. people and the Ukrainian people have had a long rivalry going back to the 1600s. They are divided by language. They're divided by religion. They're divided by production, geographic production. Russia has the oil. Ukraine doesn't have any oil. Ukraine is a great breadbasket. They raise a lot of wheat. Yeah. They're farmers. And yeah. we know from the point of view of economic history, the farming class are semi-slaves, semi-serfs for the capitalist class. So we now have a Putin that is a capitalistic Russia. Yeah. It is now a plutocracy. And it's playing ball with British capitalism, German capitalism, and American capitalism. Okay, so what would be the point of uh, jazzing up some kind of conflict between the NATO countries and Russia? Is that it's, just not, for, it's only the United States interested in that. Germany is not interested in that. Germany wants to import. So why is the United States interested in, in making a big deal Because out of this? the State Department is rather stupid. The State Department is not well informed. Why did the Cold War last so long? It started in 1947, it was, and it lasted until 1991. I think part of the reason is because it was convenient for both sides to keep no, it going. No, it wasn't convenient for both sides. Uh, because okay, let's go back to 1945. In 1945, the Soviet Army, the British Army, and the American Army marched into Germany. And they divided Germany into three zones, the British zone, the American zone, and the Russian zone. Now, the original idealistic idea was that the big three would bring back German democracy. Okay, that was the big ideal in 1945. And that's what Roosevelt believed. Roosevelt got Soviet Union to sign the United Nations. And the United Nations would have five great powers, United States, Soviet Union, and Britain. Those three were really great powers. Now, France was an honorary member because they were defeated in World War I militarily. They were defeated in World War II uh, militarily. So the French vote was either going to lean toward Britain or the United States, depending upon the politics in Paris. But they were not really sovereign. They were an honorary member. Now, China was in civil war, 
and the United States was backing Chiang Kai-shek to be the ruler of China. Well, China was in revolution, and there was a Chinese Soviet set up led, led by Mao Zedong. Now, Stalin was secretly supporting Mao Zedong to take over, and the United States was sending Lend Lee's aid to Chiang Kai-shek and try and bolster Chiang Kai-shek to sit in the United Nations, and that would be a secret vote for America. Well, it didn't work out for the United States because Mao Zedong, in 1949, conquered the whole Chinese mainland except for the island of Taiwan, and Chiang Kai-shek fled to Taiwan. And then that led to the Korean War and another problem between America and the Soviet Union. And the British were now third-rate. Churchill knew that the United States was number one, Soviet Union was number two, and Britain would have to hang on to the American alliance for its own sovereignty. So when the United States decided to go into South Korea and protect South Korea from North Korea, the British said, well, we'll go along. We'll become volunteers to the UN. Well, the United States sent 90% of the troops. The British sent a brigade or maybe a division, or not even a division, it was maybe a half a regiment or something. And the French did the same thing in order to build up the Western Bloc, okay? Well, anyway, the Korean War resulted in a stalemate. Mao Zedong didn't win, Joseph Stalin didn't win, and Dean Acheson and President Truman didn't win, and they signed a ceasefire at the DMZ, which was approximately near the old 38th parallel, which was an arbitrary truce. By the way, it was Dean Rusk and a Soviet colonel that drew that line. The 38th parallel, <coughs> that was a, a temporary gap. Because at the end of the war, the, it was agreed that the United States would take over Japan. It was also agreed the Soviet Union would take over Manchuria. But Yalta, they never mentioned Korea. So in August, after Roosevelt was dead, Stalin said, okay, we're going to take Korea. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. General MacArthur says, we're going to take Korea. So General MacArthur gets a colonel by the name of Dean Rusk. You go up there and meet that Soviet colonel. And they agreed to split it in half at the 38th parallel. Well, by 1950, five years later, we had a Korean War. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, anyway, mm -hmm. we got the background of the Korean War but and the, and the so-called uh, problem of American growing imperialism. Right. The first really big uh, police action. It was a so-called police action. That's what we always used to call it when yeah, I was growing that's up. Propaganda. My propaganda. <laughs> My, uh, my uh, parents always called it a police action. Your father because, actually believed in the police action? Well, they said because it, because it was never, not a declared war. That the Congress was supposed to declare technically, war. Technically makes it a yeah, police but action. Why didn't Truman go to Congress and ask for a cold war? Why didn't they ask for a declared war? That's my guess is because of nu <laughs> nuclear weapons. Uh, well, that's possible. That's possible. Because they had the ability, you know, then you have to, def then, then if you have nuclear weapons, you have to uh, justify why you're not using them. Yeah. Well, look, we're in a war. Why don't you use them? We've yeah, got but, them. Uh, Let's end this war. Okay. The nuclear weapon was really in the back burner because the United States launched two nuclear bombs on Japan. They had a third one that they never used. Now, only in 1949, did the Soviet test a nuclear bomb? And that surprised the United States. Mm -hmm. Because the United States was so proud of its own technology. They'd say, oh, it would take the Soviets 20 years to get the bomb. Well, the Soviet nuclear scientists weren't that stupid. Well, we also, <laughs> we also we, but I believe we also had uh, someone in uh, the technology who was who had access to the nuclear secrets, who gave them to the Russians. Yeah, well, there was a guy by the name of Klaus Fuchs. Yeah, we had Klaus And Fuchs. the reason why he did it was because he wanted a parody. Well, he, he was wanted, a communist. He was a communist. Well, uh, he was a German communist, Klaus Fuchs. Okay, what about Oppenheimer? Oppenheimer didn't. Oppenheimer was not a spy, but Oppenheimer had a certain shadow. Oppenheimer was Jewish, and he went to Berkeley, 
And I thought he said that I gave them some no, the secrets. No, he never said that whatsoever. Oppenheimer was in charge of the Los Alamos project. And he was greatly frightened of Nazi Germany because the Nazi Germany had the leading nuclear physicists in the world. Einstein was German and his disciples. Uh, Werner von Braun. Well, he was in missiles, somebody else. Well, that's part of it. You yeah. need a missile yeah. to use okay. a nuclear well, weapon. Well, there were all kinds of nuclear scientists trained in first Berlin, and then they went to Berkeley, where the United States got uh, into it. Operation Paperclip. Yeah, and then they went to Cambridge. So the British were technologically even with the Americans in 1945. Now, this guy Klaus Fuchs immigrated to Britain and worked in the Cambridge lab. And then when he saw that the United States was going ahead, and Oppenheimer was going ahead, he got himself implanted inside uh, Los Alamos. Oh, okay. Okay. And the FBI never caught him until after it was too late. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, but they were after Rosenberg. You remember the Rosenberg case? Oh yeah, Alfred Rosenberg and Julius Rosenberg. Right, they they got executed for, they got for executed. supposedly passing nuclear secrets. Yeah. Well, they were second string spies. They were not Klaus Fuchs. Yeah. <laughs> well, they were. They may have been like patsies or something. Yeah. They but may Op not have actually Oppenheimer done it. was not a, a Soviet spy, and he was an American patriot, and he was Jewish, and he wanted the United States to uh, get the bomb before the Germans did. However, there was some debate, the fact that Germany had already surrendered and who was gonna drop the bomb on Japan. Oppenheimer had some doubts about that and he became somewhat of a nuclear pacifist. Yeah. And he then was... he got into a big fight with Edward Teller about building the hydrogen bomb. In other words, uh, uh, Oppenheimer said, the bomb is too big, it'll destroy the world. The only thing you can do is disarm. So uh, you might call Oppenheimer a premature pacifist. Yeah. Okay. Well, he, was, he was terribly frightened by what he got But if they took away his security, he, they took a, the American State Department took away his security clearance Yeah. because he did have a sister who did join the Communist Party. Uh, and he had a brother or something. Uh, speaking of security clearances, now this is, this is about uh, Do you want to say something? Yeah, I'm wondering if you guys are going to talk about Brexit. <laughs> well, we have, we, we, we are going to talk about Brexit, but before we talk about that, I wanted to talk about uh, the fallout from the decision not to prosecute Hillary Clinton. The uh, decision, that, okay, that's very recent. Very recent. Okay. And, and what, and what I've was all Hillary, what was Hillary charged with? And who was charging her? Nobody charged her with anything. Okay. Okay, they were, they were, the, the FBI decided we're not going to charge her. Right. But they were investigating her. They did investigate her. They were investigating her about uh, an email, uh, when she was Secretary of State, she went right. to a private server in her basement of her home. That's right. And was using this private server and, and sending and receiving thousands upon thousands upon thousands of emails. Right. And those are essentially public property. But she refused to turn them over, and she actually tried to erase and did erase thousands of them, and then said that uh, she turned over, uh, turned all the ones over that were work related. But she made the decision about which ones were work related or not. And there's also a strong possibility that she was hacked because it was an open server. It was just an ordinary public server. So she and, was reckless, as the FBI said. And she was the, reckless. Ex, she was r careless. <laughs> careless. Extremely careless. Right. And now the and so they decided not to uh, prosecute. Prosecute. But the question is, if it is not, if there's nothing wrong with doing that, they said he said no prosecutor would prosecute f someone for what she did. Uh, in other words, it's not illegal, and her intent was not to uh, do espionage. She, her, she was not deliberately committing espionage against the United States. It was just carelessness. Okay, so this is now 
a precedent, a legal precedent, and you already have someone else who's being prosecuted right now who's planning to use that defense that I didn't do it on purpose, it was an accident, that I um, uh, used, that I did top secret and above top secret on my private email. And so they're, they're wondering how this they, is going who's to... They, who's they? They meaning... Uh, the FBI is the one who's going to bring an indictment. Anybody, anybody but, in government, no, anybody in government or the military who gets caught... Gets uh, caught. Gets, but, gets caught. Now, wait. Yeah, wait, okay. let me finish the sentence. Okay. Gets caught um, giving away secrets, top secret or above top secret secrets. All they have to do is say that, well, it was an accident. And then they should be able to get off scot free. Okay. But when you look at a prosecution, or I was careless, they could yeah. just say I'm careless. I was careless. Oh, I was being careless. When you look at a prosecution by the FBI and the Attorney General of the United States, every case is different. You're going to have to sit up a oh, little bit. Sorry. You're off the camera. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, well, glad you told. Yeah, me. your head is off the camera. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Too relaxed. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was in charge of the FBI from 1924 to when he retired in 1976 when, when Nixon, uh, 72, 72 when Nixon was president. Well, then they had new FBI chiefs, okay? So the attorney general of the president has the power to appoint an FBI director. Now, Hillary Clinton is protected by Obama and his attorney general. And it was originally a black man, and now they have a black woman. So they're the ones who say... Loretta Lynch. Yeah. She's the Eric one... Eric Holder had to step yeah. down. Yeah, okay. Well, the FBI will only prosecute if they get the signal. The FBI doesn't actually prosecute. They investigate. They investigate. But they recommend. They recommend an arraignment. Right. They recommend indictment right. Right. Uh, or not. Right. And so in this case, they... But they're protected by, by the Obama administration. Hillary is protected by the Obama administration. Uh, and yeah. all the Republicans can do to, is complain, and then when if they win the election, they may reopen the case. Well, they could because <laughs> the statute of limitations is seven years. Okay. So they have plenty of time to prosecute. Well, we'll have to see who wins the election. <laughs> well, but what, but typically, once it, once they start prosecuting their own, then they open all of themselves up to prosecution because. So many of them are involved in criminal activity anyway that they're un that they may not be they may be afraid to open up that can of worms. Yeah. Well, Joe McCarthy was a demagogue, and unfortunately, Donald Trump is a demagogue, and they can charge anything they want, and they can change their mind anything they want. But if Trump gets elected, he's going to appoint his own attorney general. If he doesn't get elected. Goodbye, Donald Trump. Well, <laughs> yeah, and Hillary Clinton has already promised if she gets to be elected that Loretta Lynch will keep her job. Well, that's her business. We've already, so Loretta Lynch the knows. White, the whites of Texas are not going to leave. But you understand the conflict of interest. Yeah, there's here. a race Potential problem. Potential conflict there of interest. There is a race problem, and you can bet your bottom dollar. No, it's not that. It's the, that, it's that. <laughs> what would happen to Loretta Lynch if she didn't yeah. uh, support okay. Hillary Clinton? Well, you know the significance. She would lose her job, for yeah, one but, thing. But you know the significance of the Mason-Dixon line, and you know the significance of Ted Cruz. You know what the Civil Ted War is Cruz. all Ted Cruz. Ted is Cruz. The, I, I vague, vaguely remember him. Ted Cruz. Didn't he run for president about uh, yeah, 20 yeah. years ago? No. Oh, the, no, that was uh, this. Yeah, you're, you're kidding us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I remember well, him. I yeah. remember Ted, Ted okay. Cruz, yeah. So we have several conflicts here. We got the Democrats versus the Republicans. We still have the North against the South, and we still have black versus white throughout the whole United States. Thirteen percent of the population are black. Two percent are Jewish. Okay. The whites still have a majority, but the whites are well, divided. Well, don't forget the Hispanics. 
All right, the Hispanics are about 20 percent, and they're growing. In some places, they're over 50 percent. California. States. California is minority white. Yeah. The, yeah. the Hispanics plus the Asians plus the blacks outrank uh, the whites in California. Yeah. But the money is in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco and Los Angeles and Hollywood. So we still have a white elite in California. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. But uh, so there's a class conflict, a race conflict, an ethnic conflict, and uh, Democratic versus Republican conflict. But I think that uh, it doesn't break uh, strictly on lines on racial lines. It depends on I, which side of the so-called divide you're on. You know, there are there no. It's are, not strict. You know, there are some whites and, who are And you could also say males versus females. That's another problem. They've got uh, a fourth if, dimension. If we're trying to, <laughs> trying to look at, at, um, at all the potential problems. Yeah, uh, okay. But, yeah, I mean, what I, what I think, and a lot of people like me think, are that um, there are governments throughout history like to use the natural divisions in order to get people fighting among themselves to take their their mind off of the crim, criminal behavior of the leadership in the country well that, um, you're, you're looking at this from the point of view of the banker you're looking at this from the point of view of the banker well the bankers uh typically the bankers are interested in money well they the, don't care about race they don't also they <laughs> they are interested in maintaining their wealth and, 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 and increasing, increasing their wealth right, and their power and their holdings. Right. Uh, like when we look at uh, the Rothschild family. That's instance, correct. Uh, and they were international bankers. They the, got banks in all and countries. They made their fortune in the early part of the 19th century. That's right. Uh, in about 1815. Well, no, about uh, 1848. That's when they begin. Well, but in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, they started, right. They made a huge coup. Right. Uh, and uh, That was the first bank in Frankfurt. But you see, in 1848, they had five brothers. They sent one to Vienna, one to London, one to Paris, and it became an international bank. And would you say that the Rothschilds are still a powerful force in uh, well, they get, banking? They, they're still a force, but their money is greatly reduced because they lost a lot in World War I and World War II. So there was a pacifist Rothschilds, by the way, who inherited the Progressive magazine. He, he, his, his name was a Rothschilds. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he well, edited Progressive. Right. He'd recently died, uh, but he was not interested in money. He was not interested in the family. Not all the Rothschilds uh, are bankers. That's not all of them. That's right. Some of them are artists. I yeah. mean, they, they've split off, and some yeah. of them have been sort of disowned from right. the family. Right. Uh, I mean, there's a lot. There are Rothschilds around. Yeah. Uh, but but they're, they're quiet and behind the scenes. But I think it's important for people to understand that they are still very much a force to be reckoned with, uh, and they do. Um, well, give, the new, the new give lavish parties in their in their the uh, new the new banking uh, like, head is George Soros. Who's George Soros? George Soros is a is a left wing multi billionaire, right? Um, and he's very interested. He's left wing in politics. He loves control. He's he he's loves, wa he wants profits for his company. <laughs> he loves power. He loves control. And he's and dual he, citizenship. And he loves to yeah dual and he, citizenship. And he loves to uh, uh, influence politics. So he's very interested in politics, and he and he uh, his money goes to hundreds of different organizations. That's true. Foundations, uh, uh, and he that, that he agrees with that yeah. he thinks, um, and some of them are pretty good. Some of them are quite sinister, right. in my opinion. In your opinion. Uh, and uh, I don't and, know. I, I haven't been. I'm not inside. Well, you have to look, well, you, have, you can look on the Internet and find out where right, his what money is, goes. What is, what is an example of his sinister role? Um, well, you know, he's he is uh, his money um, goes to um, destabilize certain countries. Uh, I mean, he's interested in 
the he's, United he's, States, what, what, United is, States is, what he, he, losing, he, losing sovereignty. He, you know, he, he likes the idea of one world government. Yeah, but he has his money in a thing called hedge funds. You know what a hedge fund is? Yes, I do. A hedge fund, there are about five money men who have enough money to have a fund. You've got to have a million dollars to get into it. You and I can't get in a hedge fund. But if you've got several million dollars, you can put your money in a secret account, and George Soros has one. And nobody knows how much of that is in gold, how much of that is in dollars, how much is in pounds, how much in yen, because he can shift foreign exchange around. Just in the last few weeks. <laughs> That's what uh, a hedge fund is. Just in the last few weeks, uh, Soros has made over a billion dollars in I the last few weeks. I believe that. You know how he did that? I just read about it. How did he do it? Uh, he did it by, um, you know, bre before Brexit, yeah. um, he bought a lot of gold. That's right. And, uh, and so gold has been puttering along at, you know, at a certain rate for several years, right? right? And he, he, his bet was that if, that if Brexit um, if failed, British, if, if it failed, yeah. then gold would probably pretty much stay the same. Yeah. But if it passed, then gold would go up, and it did. And, he, and so he made a lot of money right. when, uh, because, w because the price of gold went whoosh, Not really up. high, but it, it, it went, probably only went up $10. But if no, he's got billions, it, those $10 added up to more billions. Well, yeah. it, 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 it actually, it actually <laughs> went up well, uh, from a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, from $1,200, let's get some figures. At least uh, a couple hundred bucks. It, yeah, it went up, at least. Well, if not more, maybe, close, see if got, maybe closer to 400. No, I don't think it went up that high. Yeah, from I got 1200 some, to 1600. Well, hey, I got some figures. Well, just let me look at it. Remember, uh, gold is is was going at 1200 dollars per ounce. Okay. Per ounce. All right. And uh, here's the New York Times index. I got two of them. Two dates. Now this is, uh, you can read this, can you? This is gold. Gold was selling at, what is that, 1500 Okay. Uh, 16, I thought at 1200 1200 what? Uh, around 1200 All right. What so, was what So was now it? it's 13, 1300 So it went up $100. It went up $100. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's how he made his money. $100 yeah. an ounce. Yeah. Well, that, that amounts to billions in the hedge yeah. fund. And, you, and the <laughs> thing about it is, too, that, that they, they have the gold certificates, the gold stocks, basically. Yeah. Just a piece of paper that you buy that says you, this is the equivalent of so many ounces of gold or yeah. pounds of gold. And, and well, they sell so, them in ounces. <laughs> nobody, has a, nobody can afford a bar of gold. <laughs> well, you uh, got to have $1,260 just to get one ounce. That's only that big. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> you and I are not in the gold business. We can get well, a gold coin. I have one piece of gold. Yeah, gold. you got to have one I, gold coin. you got a gold coin. That's got about... It's a quarter ounce. Quarter I have ounce. one quarter ounce <laughs> gold coin. Gold coin. <laughs> well, it was higher than that. It used to be as high as 1800 an ounce. Yeah. Back 10 yeah. years ago, five well, years ago. I have, I have more silver. Yeah. Silver is the poor man's gold, okay. known as the poor man's gold. Yeah, but gold. anyway, the hedge fund and Soros and Buffett and uh, I, uh, Icon, those three guys can anticipate the market. They yeah. can anticipate oil and gold, and they know ahead of everybody else whether oil is going to go up or down. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, now, interestingly, uh, uh, can the... W the an incredible amount of money was made on 9-11. Yes, I believe that. Uh, and I just found out something new about 9-11 uh, that in that, okay, between the time that the f first plane hit the first building yeah. and the second plane hit the second building, yeah. it was about a 40-minute gap. Right. And during that time, the computers, apparently, people were in those buildings. Yeah. And they were taken over and they just went crazy yeah deleting stuff yeah somebody got control of those computers and there was robbery going on right huge amounts of robbery going on in those buildings yes in that window 
between the time when that's the first plane hit and the, and the plane and the building collapsed. That's what you say on the what evidence now? Do we have that in a footnote, um, or is that just on television? I saw a, uh, a documentary. About a document that's a TV uh, show, right? A documentary is a TV. I saw a documentary. Uh, that's oral. That's not written. You don't have a, a document. Well, I like I like video better than print. Well, I don't. That's where you and I differ. Because you could see the guy's mouth move. <laughs> talk is cheap. My mother used to know that. But writing is only ri talking written no, down. No, no, no. The archives, the German archives, and the British archives, and the American archives don't lie. Now, John Gaddis. Well, unfortunately, they do. No, John. Well, here's what here's what John Gaddis. You've heard of John Gaddis. You know who John Gaddis is. Uh, it rings was, a bell, but well, anyway, he was America's. He was Ohio University's most distinguished historian. Okay. And over the course of what about Paul Kendall? But he, he was, was pretty. A, he was pretty. Uh, Paul Kendall was an, a fictional writer. He no. was a Shakespearean scholar. He was a historian, too. Well, he was a Shakespearean scholar, and he discovered new archives in Italy. Because when uh, Henry, the, uh, was it Henry the Third died, and Henry the uh, Henry, yeah, Henry He wrote a very famous book about Richard the Third. Richard the Third. I got the wrong man. Yeah, Richard the yeah, Third died. Yeah, well, he, biography. Yeah, well, he got from the British embassy in Italy some primary sources. So he wrote a new biography of, yeah. of yeah. Richard III. Yeah, yeah. I have a copy of it. You have a copy? I have a copy of it. Yeah. A first edition signed by right. Paul Kendall. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's, that'll yeah. be a good... good pretty neat. Yeah, right. But he was, he was a professional Shakespearean scholar who happened to have a hobby in history. Oh, okay. I thought he was a history professor. No, he was not a history. He, he, well, he was a professor, wasn't he? He was a professor of English. He taught Shakespeare. He was an English professor. He taught I that. I thought he was a history professor. No, he was an English professor who taught before Sam Crowell. Sam Crowell, when, when he died, and was replaced by Sam Crowell. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, oh, I didn't realize any, that. Well, you can look that up in the thing. But anyway, uh, hmm. he was still alive when I came to Ohio University oh, in 1964. Okay. Yeah. But I would like to have met him. He died. How'd you get the autograph copy? I bought it in a used bookstore in Athens. That's cheap. How much did you pay? Ten. Ten dollars. That's cheap. That's a bargain. Yeah, it was a bargain. That's yeah. good. Yeah. It's probably worth about 50 bucks. Who knows? Uh, Paul Kendall's reputation is gradually fading, as all historians. Anyway, to get back to John Gaddis. Yeah. John Gaddis is now at Yale. But he was one of the few Ohio University historians who got promoted through publication, okay? And he came here about 1971 or so. I don't remember exactly. I was here before he was. And he was only an assistant professor. And he worked all of his life on writing a biography of George F. Kennan. Now, George F. Kennan was a professional diplomat, and he got his degree from Princeton in, in, in Russian language. And in 1927, before the United States recognized the Soviet Union, he was stationed in Riga, and in, that's in Latvia. Right. And all of the refugee communists and Soviet czarist people and white Russians who hated Stalin went into Riga and gave oral testimony to the State Department. So it came to a surprise. It, George Kennan was in Moscow in 1933 when Franklin Roosevelt decided to recognize the Soviet Union. And the United States was the last major power to do so. Britain, hmm. Italy, France, uh, all of the major powers of Europe had already recognized the Soviet Union in 1922, 24, in that period, okay? So the United States was hostile to both. They assumed, under Woodrow Wilson, they assumed Bolshevism would fail, communism would fail, we don't have to recognize them. Well, by 1933, Japan was on the rise, Germany was on the rise, and Rose says, hey, we've got to recognize the Soviet Union. 
Well, anyway, uh, Roosevelt had ambassadors in Moscow that were going to cooperate with Stalin, anticipating that the United States is going to need, and Churchill had that same anticipation, the United States is going to need Stalin in the coming World War II. They predicted that, that Japan and Germany are going to attack the uh, Soviet Union. Well, anyway, well, I, I kind of got to find a footnote. John, uh, uh, Kennan was only a, a, a second counsel in the embassy. Well, in 1946, when Truman was president, he wrote a, a long telegram saying, we need a new policy toward the Soviet Union. And that was called containment. He said, you can't win with atomic bombs. What you should do is contain the Soviet Union by a so-called Iron Curtain, have plenty of conventional arms between Stettin and Trieska as Winston Churchill, back up Winston Churchill, and don't let the Soviet conventional forces invade Western Europe. But the nuclear arms race is a failure. That was called containment. Contain the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain. Mm -hmm. And that worked, mm -hmm. but it took until 1991. <laughs> Kennedy was 101 years old. He outlived the so-called Cold War. He outlived Stalin and yeah. saw the Soviet Union collapse. Yeah. So containment worked, but it took a lot of patience to do it. Okay, but... Uh, okay, now, when but what I'm saying is that John Gaddis has got footnotes because he read every single document that Kennan ever wrote, and he read all the State Department, both pro and con, and he wrote the British and the French and Soviet, and he interviewed Soviet people and so forth. So that's what you call true history. Okay, well, I will say Footnoted. this. I will say this. About, with a, with a about bibliography. Nine, about 9-11. Go ahead. Uh, and I, will, I would like to remind you what uh, Winston Churchill said about whether or not people, someone asked him whether or not they thought history would treat him kindly. Yeah. And he said, it will because I intend to write it. That's what he said at Tehran. That's uh, what he said to Roosevelt. That was a private conversation. Well, not anymore. But well, it was released. We have the Tehran <laughs> papers. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> just, just so we know that the, the winners write the history. That's, you know. At, well, uh, Churchill's exaggerating. They have a first chance at rewriting it. But in the case of the Jewish history, Hitler and Goebbels thought they were going to write the history because they thought they were going to win. Sure. But they didn't win. And they could tell the whole story differently. Yeah. And, and um, the Holocaust historians have exposed Nazism and anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the losers write history. <laughs> the losers write again. Well, you take the American Civil War. The Confederates wrote their own history. The Northerners wrote their history. You know the joke about the, the Civil War? What's that? The Civil War was invented in Pennsylvania. But Virginia calls it the war between the states. And Texas calls it the war for Southern independence. Yeah. And Massachusetts calls it the war of the Great Rebellion. So choose your bias. <laughs> sure. uh, well, so we have to take that into account, I think, when we look and at All history. historians are biased. But I would say this about 9-11. Yeah, go ahead. And that is that... that um, there, w there were, on 9-11, a huge spike in what they call put options. Oh, yes. I know what they are. Okay. And These that are was buying, buying stocks and bonds ahead of time by saying, I'm going to buy 50 shares of, of uh, AT&T in the future because I predict they're going to go up. A, no, down. Down. Okay, predict that's that they're the, going to go down. The call, call yeah, is the yeah, opposite. It's the opposite. <laughs> yeah, a put okay. option. And so there was a huge spike yeah. just before 9-11. On which stocks? Uh, uh, All stocks. On U.S. Airlines, American uh, Airlines, uh, United uh, Airlines. Good. On the airlines. Okay. So someone knew ahead of time that there was going to be, those, those planes were going to be hijacked. Right. And they made a lot of money because though both uh, the stocks on both those airlines that had the hijacked planes tanked. Right. Right after 9-11. And uh, so this is, that's just one example. That's and there right. were also... A huge amount of buying people, uh, 
people, uh, stocks bought for Raytheon. Yeah, I believe that. Just before 9-11. I believe that. Um, and the Raytheon, because as soon as, as right after 9-11, America was gearing up for war immediately. That's true. They started to just, ma just gun up. You right. know, they were, right. right. And that, uh, so there was people who made money on that, too. I believe that. And they made it because they knew what was going to come. I believe happen. that, and right, right now we're, and also you had, the, you had, you had uh, Hank Paulson. Yes, he who, was, he was in on it. Just a day before 9/11, right. announced that two trillion dollars had actually accidentally vanished <laughs> from the from the Pentagon <laughs> on on September 10th, 2001. Yeah. and then they have Building uh, 13. You know, there were two buildings, two towers. And then there's this little building. Building seven. Building seven. Yeah, 48 stories. <laughs> Not that little. It was a skyscraper. Yeah. But, but it fell just by accident. It fell completely. By accident, so-called. By, by four, at four o'clock or 4.30 on that day. In the day. afternoon, yeah. Uh, and some say there was an explosion on the inside. Oh, there was lots of explosions on the inside. <laughs> Not just one. But this hasn't been proven yet in a court of law. <laughs> but anybody who knows anything about controlled demolition, just look at the video. Yeah. And you can see that it falls at free fall yeah. in it, into its own footprint, into a pile of rubble. Yeah. There's a lot of controversy about that. It's like, it's like uh, Dallas. Who killed John Kennedy? Was Oswald alone or did he have help? I don't think Oswald <laughs> did it a lot at all. <laughs> you, can, you have lots of conspiracy theories. But you know what? <laughs> Guess what? This thing that happened last night was very close to Dealey Plaza. That's interesting. Very close. That's very interesting. Yes. Uh, and this, these snipers who were high up. Now, my question is, did it even really happen? Who knows? Now, now you have the Dallas Morning News. <laughs> well, that's not going to help necessarily because um, over and over and over, what we're seeing is orchestration. More and more control. And if you remember, the police state Hitler, is growing. Hitler used the false, state is growing. history, Hitler used uh, false events. That's right. Uh, he pretended that the the Pol the Poland attacked one of his yeah, outposts. Yeah, that was phony. And, and, and he got some Polish prisoners and and shot that's them right. and dressed them up in right. in Polish military uniforms and phony. laid them around. Yeah. And said, "Look, look what they did," yeah. and that gave him his justification yeah. to attack Poland. That, so this is nothing new. Yeah. This is nothing new. So Politicians we, we have always lie. have to look at Politicians the, at the possibility that's right. that this is, there's orchestration involved in this. Uh, that's right. Uh, so we can't forget that. We tend to be very, very trusting. If it's on the news, it must be true. I don't believe that. I don't think so I'm necessarily. Not, I'm no. not that trusting. I'm not that trusting either. And I think people who understand but history I, know that you cannot have, necessarily I trust have, the news. I have more trust in the New York Times than I do... Fox News. Well, you know what? You know uh, Fox. You know you what? Trust Fox you know News? what? The big problem. <laughs> there's a big problem with the New York Times. Yes. And that's called the lie of omission. That's true. They simply don't report it. That's right. Very simple. They're, they're, they have their reputation uh, as selecting, truth tellers yeah. to, to to uphold. So they try to be true in the articles that they publish. Yeah, but, but they, there's they, some things they just they just they, don't take. They don't, they don't much, talk about it. They don't publish much on uh, corruption inside Israel. Tel Aviv is all. Oh my God! <laughs> I mean, it's an, apart no it's an apartheid. It's an apartheid state. Yeah, yeah. You know, it New is York so Times apartheid. Is silent on that. Uh, that what's being done to the Palestinian people is genocide, essentially. I mean, uh, some people call uh, the occupied territories just a giant concentration camp. Yeah, but that's the a, world's. That's what Art Gish used to call it. The world's biggest prison camp. Yeah, Art Gish did not. The be, West Bank. Art Gish did not believe in the uh, in the Tel Aviv government. That's clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, Arch Gish was only one individual. Well, what can you do? We're all, every one of us is only one individual. You know, he did what he could. Yeah. So, anyway, that's credibility. Who do you believe as your source? Well, he was there. He spent a lot of time there. Art Gish is a critic of... He wrote books about it. ...of uh, what he calls the neoconservatives. Well, I think he was <laughs> right. Okay. I wish he was still here. Well, he unfortunately did as much as he could. Tragic accident. But uh, Art Gish also had his flaws. His flaws was to okay. put too much credibility in 
Muslim mosques. You know, he used to go to a Jewish synagogue every Saturday, and he used to go to a, a mosque every Friday, and then he had his own Christian fellowship. He was his own minister because he went to theological school. He got a, He was a Christian. He, but he got a degree in the United Brethren Church. He was. He called. He could be called a reverend, but he didn't like reverend. Yeah. Because his, Jesus Christ didn't call himself a reverend. Right. He was only a rabbi. He was only a teacher. So yeah. he was a he was a teacher in the Jesus Christ medal, uh, model. Okay. Yeah. But he had this utopian belief that he could somehow integrate Islam, okay. Judaism, and Christianity. Okay. And he wrote a book on that. Oh. I've read his book. Oh, okay. I have a, I, re I have a couple of his books. Yeah, but yeah. but that's highly idealistic and highly utopian. It is. Yeah. He, okay. He, uh, we're History almost, doesn't move that fast. <laughs> that's right. the problem. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but sometimes it does. You know, in fits and starts. Yeah. Um, there are amazing things that happen. Boom, 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 and yeah. everything changes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're almost. So out as of time. Lois would say, what has this got to do with? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Brexit. <laughs> Do you want well, we have less than that, to, actually. We only have about a minute left, okay. at the most. All right. uh, I would just say that uh, we, have, we have to wait until Article 50 uh, gets initiated uh, to make sure that England really will pull out of the U European Union. Yeah. And we'll have to... to the, we, there is a lot of fear in the European Union that there's going to be a problem. They said NATO is now weakened because... Right. Uh, this is something that I just heard in the last 24 hours because they're worried about this confrontation with Russia. Right. And now NATO is going to be weaker. And uh, they like, they want, to, I believe they want to start up a new Cold War for okay. their own purposes. If I have a minute uh, of rebuttal, I would but say... But make it very quick. Uh, very quick. My uh, minute of rebuttal is that most of the commentators in New York and in London are betting that the exit vote is passe and there'll be some kind of renegotiation and the British will stay in Euro at least for 10 years. In or the European least, Union? Yeah, okay. at, le at least for four years. At least four years, yeah. okay. At least, well, in other words, um, uh, Obama wants it, Hillary wants it, the Democrats want it, yeah. Wall Street wants it. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, and the Bank of England wants it, so they'll stay in. We'll see you. That's uh, all we have for today. Thanks for coming on, Bob. <laughs> okay. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay, that's everybody. We're out of time. Time, so uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Okay.